Have you heard of resin mites? Those tiny worm-shaped pests that scar, gnarl, deform, and blister your plants? At about 200 micrometers in length and about 50 micrometers in width and reaching adulthood in about a week, areophyes, as they're known in scientific literature, replicate quickly on plants and for a select group of cultivated crop species, cause extreme damage. Hemp, aloe, pine, coconut, tomato, pear, tulip, citrus, poplar, garlic, wheat, almond, mango, and rose, among others, are all severely damaged by the particular species that have specialized to them. For the thousands of other species, the relationship is more benign. The mites penetrate 10 to 70 micrometers with their needle-like stylet and drain the contents of surface plant cells they encounter. Those that are more damaging have saliva that contains a cocktail of compounds that causes the tissues to twist and deform. In some plant species like box elder and chokecherry, this can result in bizarre gall structures that shelter the mites from environmental and predator pressures and is the source for the alternative name blister or gall mite. This manipulation of plant physiology is still not totally understood, but is extremely severe, costing millions in agricultural damage from yield or outright plant losses. Close to 600 million years ago, the ancestors of the first arthropods, the group of armored animals that contains crustaceans, insects, mites, and more, developed in ancient oceans and are thought to have been, mainly, small detrivores that fed on decaying organic matter and the microbes among it, developing close relationships with them in their bodies in the warm, shallow seas and microbe-encrusted land. The lineage we today call arachnids diverged early in its aquatic inception, representing some of the first animals eventually adapted to land. Some estimations emphasize a major importance of mites in the development of terrestrial soils in concert with early plants and springtails, which look like, but actually evolved before, insects. The taxonomic group that encompasses all recit mites called Areophyoidea has long been poorly understood evolutionarily in its relationship to related groups, but molecular clocks estimate it to have diverged around 550 million years ago the time of the earliest terrestrial fungi and land plant fossils known. Although more of it is needed, this recent research strongly suggests recent mites descend from an old, early diverging lineage of worm-like mites living in a deep soil regolith. Collections of loose rocky shards deep below the soil line called nematolycidae, many of which feed on microbes that may have had some association with early plants. Such an association may have lent itself to the plant parasitic mites we see today, as the closely related Novophytotus species have been found existing under the surface of grass plant tissues, apparently benefited by their tapered body. Grasses as a group though are relatively new, estimated to originate within 70 million years or so, but evidence suggests of mites colonizing ferns as well as cone and flower producing plants that came after. This could explain their extreme diversity and adaptation to so many plant species half a billion years from their divergence, following the evolutionary development of their hosts and their derivative species. Rosamites have a unique physiology owing to their highly reduced genome. They have lost many genes that remain in closely related mite lineages. In the tomato russet mite, Aculops lycoperseci, most notably, this includes common genes related to chemical detection and neutralizing plant toxins, which is congruent with the tendency for specialist organisms to develop narrower senses. They also lost some Hox genes, which are important in all animals for body structure development and may influence their interesting four-legged body, unlike the eight legs of most other arachnids. The tomato russet mite has a genome size of only 32.5 megabase pairs, the smallest of all arthropods at time of documentation in 2020, and more common for a single cell organism. It also lacks introns and has few repeat sequences, something larger genomes typically have. Previously, one of the smallest genomes was the two-spot spider mite at 90 megabase pairs, 
and some of the largest include Califera grasshoppers at over 6,000 megabase pairs, or 6 gigabase pairs. This reduction has serious implications. Often, larger genomes correlate with size and capabilities from having generally more genes. However, many species that develop a close dependence on another organism, particularly parasites that specialize closely with their host, lose genes over time because their many ancestral traits important for survival in the older lifestyle and the genes that express them become less important to overall success. A sort of dependence on the host starts to form at this point, more or less sealing the fate of a species and binding it, its microbiome, and its descendants. Like plants, mites and insects have a close relationship with mutualist microbes and even establish a microbiome with pathogenic plant microbes to form mutual benefit. Xanthomonas campestris, which causes black rot, Clavobacter michiganensis, which causes ring rot, and several species of Pseudomonas and Erwinia, for example, are known to be associated with some russet mites. Additionally, the establishment of genes from other microbes like bacteria and fungi has occurred several times in mites and insects and their ancestors, with evidence for retaining the ability to synthesize vitamin B5 and a few bacterial detoxification genes more common in other species. Russet mites also have phytotoxic saliva, at least many do, and its primary effect seems to manipulate the development of foliar tissue in extreme ways, resulting in crumpled and deformed leaves or exotic chambers to feed, sheltered from the elements or predators. The composition is poorly understood, but likely interferes with and triggers various hormone signaling pathways, as in other gulf forming organisms, and russet mites may be exploiting an inflammatory response that envelops them. As technically most russet mites do not create these elaborate changes, it is unclear what led to separate russet mite lineages developing similar adaptations while others led an uneventful and harmless life as a so-called vagrant parasite of their host and do essentially no damage. Some microbes, like a special bacteria called Wolbachia and possibly Agrobacterium, may have a mutualistic relationship whereby the mite penetrates cells to feed and vector the bacteria, which then proliferate and contribute to some phytohormonal response or other immune disrupting effects, but research investigation is still ongoing. Whatever the reason, this dramatic damage is highly visible and makes detection relatively simple. No matter their level of health, it is extremely challenging for plants to be pumped with a body mutating and dissolving solution. Damaged tissue does not revert back to normal after treatment, making it potentially necessary to cull plants whole or in part due to cosmetic or horticultural reasons. Their damage profile is similar to the damage of broad mites in some cases. A similarly tiny but oblong American football shaped mite species with a wide overlapping host range. Detection and discrimination between rest of mites and broad mites should be possible at 30x magnification and greater, confirming activity by evaluating body shape and movement. Russet mites, like many mites and insects, have a special reproduction style whereby females will produce males when unmated and females when mated, a state known as being haplodiploid. Functionally, that means only a single female is necessary for a colony to develop. A significant portion of a female russet mite's body is developed for the production of eggs, 20 to 60 micrometers in size and mating choice is random, as males produce packets of genetic material deposited externally that females encounter and then utilize at a later time. Russet mites have six life stages, egg, prelarva, larva, protonymph, deuteronymph, tritonymph, and then adult. But there's two unique traits related to adulthood. Not only do males of many different species tend to look similar to each other, more so than the female phenotype appearance of that species, but there are two different adult females, the normal protogyne and the overwintering deutogyne. 
that develops when a colony is exposed to the harsh conditions of the hot or cold seasons and seek shelter in debris or plant crevices, depending on the species. Russet mites are, for the most part, specialists that can only feed and reproduce on a single species or a collection of very closely related species. This can be due to a few reasons, but is probably best explained by the tendency for different plant species that develop from an earlier population to have a different enough physiology that specialists are poorly adapted unless they developed with the plant itself over time. Since russet mites are extremely specialized, they likely speciated with the plant while other populations specialized to others over millions of years. There are a few exceptions like the tomato russet mite, Aculops lycopersici, which feeds on over 20 species in three plant families, Solanaceae, Convolvulaceae, and Rosaceae. For these rare examples, these alternative hosts are usually less suitable than the typical host, so in many cases the thousands of species that have been documented usually require additional context like the host and geographic location to accurately identify. Fortunately, this means that russet mites must reproduce on a specific species and cannot exist elsewhere. Preventative measures can be made more efficient by acknowledging actual verified risks based on research rather than treating russet mites like other pest mites with a wider host range. If they established, it is likely because they came in on something that made contact with an infected host, entered on cuttings of an infected host, or on the airstream, especially in field conditions. Targeting these points of ingress is imperative to eliminate the chance for introduction. Its tiny size, low weight, and elongated shape make it suited for movement on wind currents in nature and will raise its legs and trunk to catch air and facilitate lift or possibly adhere to an animal or object that might get it closer to the next host nearby in a behavior called questing. One species, Acerea lychii, the lychee arenose mite, has been known to use honeybees for transport and has recently established in parts of North and South America. In nature, as in cultivation, it can be common for the next generation of plants to develop in close proximity to their parents. So this works, particularly if thousands of individuals can be produced on a moderately sized leaf and either travel through a canopy or become brushed or carried into a nearby plant population a few meters away. This has obvious implications for their prevention as every russet mite has had to develop on a suitable host and relies on fomites or carriers to end up in a cultivated space where they develop. Russet mites, or their effects, have been known for centuries, but due to their size, insightful research about their physiology or ecology has been difficult or impossible to ply until high power microscopy developed in the mid 1900s and genetic sequencing technology became more available, especially in the last few decades. This information has provided behavioral and biological insight leading to techniques that exploit their weaknesses to host range, predatory mites, safe chemistries, and disruption of movement. The breeding of plants resistant to russet mites and their pathogenic symbionts has also been refined by knowing their relationship. Perhaps until recently, some of the most famous or at least most referenced russet mite species in scientific literature and agricultural records are the wheat curl mite, coconut rust mite, and tomato rust mite, which have a worldwide distribution. Due to the swelling interest in cannabis cultivation, however, the hemp russet mite, Aculops cannabicola, seems to have gained significant attention since around the 2000s, but was first described in 1960 by H.K. Farkas. Dreaded by those aware and despised by those afflicted, there have been many rumors and mysteries surrounding it, including a pernicious myth that the California Department of Transport, or Caltrans, as well as the Oregon Department of Transport distributed hemp russet mite to surreptitiously undermine cannabis cultivation based on a misreading of a 2006 document called 
enhanced biological control of yellow star thistle and tumbleweed, Russian thistle. Obviously, the title and text makes no mention of cannabis or hemp russet mite, but it does mention using a russet mite, the salsola mite, Asteria salsole, to kill invasive and destructive Russian thistle, a tumbleweed that causes automotive and residential damage, in addition to being a fire hazard. Historical and more recent prohibitionist fervor, understandable distrust by cultivators, combined with commonplace unfamiliarity with their biology, the simple mention of the words russet mite has been enough to create disdainful alarm. Anyone familiar with the biology of russet mites as explained earlier would know that the Sassola russet mite would not be a threat to cannabis as it can only eat Russian thistle. They would know that any plan to use hemp russet mites specifically as a biocontrol for cannabis would require funding massive amounts of cannabis cultivation in addition to a comprehensive system for deployment over a span of many years to constantly challenge new populations. This is one of the advantages of understanding a pest biology and relationship to its host. It helps safeguard from uninformed rumors and gauge the viability of treatment techniques, among other domain knowledge clarity. In fact, several recent mice have been successfully utilized in the biological control of invasive plants. The skeleton weed gall mite, Asteria chondriliae, for example, has been used in the biological control of the Eurasian rush skeleton weed, Chondrilla uncia, in Australia since 1971, and in the USA as formation of galls in the vegetative growth and flower buds causes plant stunting, reduction in seed formation, and general weakness. Interestingly, the mites appear to be very specific to particular geographic subpopulations of skeleton weed. A strain of skeleton weed gall mite originating from Greece did best against its host in Australia, but performed poorly in the USA while an Italian strain has been introduced to control skeleton weed in the USA with better effect. Food for thought when considering how pest russet mites may develop in cultivation settings globally, we may see regional differences via adaptation. A short list of other russet mite biocontrols include Asaria acrotilani, which suppresses Russian knapweed, Raponticum repens, and was introduced into the Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine from Central Asia. Asaria centauriae and Asaria thessalonicae have been evaluated for control of diffuse knapweed, Centauria diffusa, in the USA and Canada. In 1971 and 1972, Asaria boise was shipped from the USA to the USSR for control of ragweed in the genus Ambrosia, and Asaria malherbe has been released for control of field bindweed, Convolvulus arvensis, and hedge bindweed. Calistegia sepium in the USA and in Canada at various points since 1989 and with pernicious persistence. St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum, is considered a noxious invasive weed in Eastern Australia, and in 1991, the russet mite Aculus hyperici was deployed in tandem with the highly voracious defoliating beetle Chrysolina quadrigemina, already established. Some russet mites vector terribly damaging pathogens like the rosebud russet mite Phylocoptes fructophilus and its symbiont the rose rosette virus in the Imara virus genus. And I should know, although documented since the 1940s and even considered a potential biocontrol for invasive roses, rose rosette disease started to establish in the USA around the 1990s and 2000s. Around 2015, rose rosette threatened the then 200 million USD global rose production as it was incurable and highly contagious due to the wind-borne and travel-prone russet mite. Several nurseries spent as much as 1 million USD disposing of infected stock and cleaning machinery and other potential vectors. Around 2016, this affected me personally 
as I was working closely with an ornamental cut flower company, one of the last left in California at the time, when all their rose cultivars imported from Holland were put under quarantine until they could be inspected and verified several times over the growing season. Resistance trials are still ongoing, and some progress has been made, but most of the biosecurity challenges depend on a sophisticated detection system that cooperates internationally. Tragically, many residential roses, including rare and one-of-a-kind rose stock with sentimental and economic value, became infected, causing additional complications for efforts to contain outbreaks. Other russet mites have been known to vector viruses from the family Podiviridae, specifically Rhymovirus, Poesivirus, and Tritemovirus. Although this family of viruses is most often transmitted by aphids, they require a special protein coat to bind with their host body, and these three virus genera lack them. The most famous and studied of these viruses is the wheat streak mosaic virus transmitted by the wheat curl mite Acerea tosicella, which is also transmitted by touch and to offspring through seed. Some of the strategies that successfully limit resamide virus transmission include the development of resistant cultivars, elimination of volunteer plants on which the mites can establish nearby, isolation from sources of the virus and vector, and modification of planting date in order to avoid their highest seasonal activity. The coconut rust mite Acerea gururanus is interesting because research shows that genetic variability and invasion patterns suggest it adapted to coconuts as a host, presumably from another species of palm tree, only after cultivation by humans in Africa and the Americas. So some species may have this capacity for adaptation to similar species of the primary host, especially developing after cultivation has become more common and perhaps more populous. Dedicated researchers like the venerable Dr. James Wesley M. Ryan Jr. and his mentor, Dr. Vikram Prasad, pioneered recent aerophyid insights along with researchers like Dr. Samuel Bolton, Thomas Van Leeuwen, Philip Chedverikov, and Hans Klompen, whose research informs many of the statements in this presentation. We also shouldn't forget Dr. Alfred Nalipa, acarologist and taxonomic authority, first publishing the name Areophyidae in 1898, making taxonomic documentation of these mites only about 125 years old. While different crops, setups, and locations will require strategies specific to those contexts, there are some techniques that can be applied more generically. No matter the context, knowing if the rest of mite of your crop is active in your local area is imperative. Common treatments that work or don't work, and making a habit of collecting this information from local experts like agricultural extension agents and farmers builds better community biosecurity. Knowledge and information is always relevant and changes over time being tied to their host development, populations are not active where the plants don't exist, but float in or are transported to nearby commercial cultivation sites and may even develop on suitable plants in residential or natural areas nearby. There is no direct control over these populations, so strong passive and reactive strategies are required. Crop scouting at regular frequent intervals aids in early detection for rapid response, preventing rusted mite populations from growing larger and more expensive to counteract, and damage from reaching challenging levels that decrease quality and yield below feasible thresholds. Proactive application of biocontrol options confirmed to manage the specific rusted mite species is useful. The most ideal scenario is to establish a biocontrol population before a colony of russet mites develops. This can be done by applying at regular intervals throughout the russet mite season, or in some way predicting the first or other incidence times based on historical data and experience or contextual events like weather patterns. The upside of regular application is consistency and reliability while being more expensive. The upside of predictive preventative application 
is efficiency and lower cost while potentially being less reliable. Predator mites like Swirskii or Cucumeris are a popular choice that have been evaluated against various russet mite species and crops and will even feed on a narrow range of other pests like thrips or whiteflies. Some crops, like tomato, have cultivars that are very hairy and this can represent difficulties for certain predatory mites to traverse and even damage them, reducing their efficiency when they move over trichomes both glandular, which will cause adhesive damage, or non-glandular, which still increase the energy needed for transmission and movement. Regular applications of even plant nutritive or mild pesticidal compounds can disrupt predatory mite and other biocontrol populations too, both lethally as well as sublethally, causing the mice to have to clean themselves or otherwise recover before resuming their literally blind search for prey by relying on scents and plant damage and pest presence to guide them. On certain banker plants like ornamental peppers or other sources of pollen, Swirskii and Cucumeris, and perhaps other relevant generalist species, can not only sustain themselves with nutrition needed to reproduce without any energy expenditure, but fortify themselves against environmental stressors like ultraviolet radiation, or provide micronutrients and hydration that can increase basic longevity in the absence of prey. Some make the claim that providing nourishment like this will keep the mice from feeding on pests, but this has never been my experience, and in studies, they have been found to feed on prey in choice tests. Conversely, a lack of food and water in the absence of pests as a preventative measure means the population will lose effectiveness and perish quicker, necessitating more orders, which is more costly. Many times, a very light dusting of cattail pollen has increased field observations by as much as quintuple in my personal experience. In some studies, a purely pollen diet was significantly more reproductive for Swirskii, so this can be a great force multiplier that decreases the mite order frequency and lowered IPM strategy cost. In South Africa, the predatory mite Amblyseia citri feeds on citrus rust mite although it is not fully effective in some reports. In Florida, where much of the citrus in the USA is cultivated, the citrus rust mite Phyllocoptruda olivora is controlled in part by the fungus Hirsutella thompsoni. Unfortunately, the fungus often is eliminated if fungicidal sprays are applied to control fungal pathogens of citrus. Culling infested plants in whole or in part is a valid strategy, especially as a procedural response to detection that doesn't require specialized equipment, though it is very important to contain the culled material carefully, securely, and dispose of it, and follow up with additional management techniques. In some contexts, it is either too laborious or costly to treat one or a few plants if highly stunted, but where there is one colony, there can easily be more. So it should be assumed that the local area around an infested plant is also infested. Oftentimes, investigating around an infested individual will show milder signs of infestation as the population expands through contact. Additionally, cultivators can spread my populations to other plants and sections or rooms of cultivation, which can lead to a piecemeal distribution. In outdoor settings, exposure to the environment makes airborne russet mites a greater threat, though this will be seasonal and greatly predicated on the local abundance of their hosts. Strong winds and host plant presence can allow a population to swell and whip through large swaths of crops, but this can be blunted by installing natural or artificial windbreaks that block and part overland air currents and help minimize dispersal nearer to the ground. Sharing agricultural equipment and tools between farms can facilitate russet mite movement. So in cases where this must happen, proper cleaning is necessary before transport in either direction. 
Several Russet Mites are mainly cosmetic nuisances rather than a lethal threat to the host, puckering flower petals and bud sites and crinkling leaf tissue in some ornamental tree species. Lasting prevention can be difficult or uneconomical without using systemic pesticides which have their own hazards in implementation, not the least of which being their accumulation in flower nectar and subsequent widespread damage to pollinators. Eliminating an annoying but relatively harmless presence in most cases is not worth the financial and ecological burden compared to instances where russet mites reduce food, medicinal, or textile resources. Safer options should be employed as much as possible. In settings where the environmental exposure is reduced, like in greenhouses or practically eliminated like climate controlled spaces, the main threat is from incoming plant tissue, like cuttings or people, and equipment that may have them if they were recently around infested plants. Limiting unnecessary contact from outside vectors reduces this risk, as does establishing a quarantine for incoming plants or cuttings, where they can be isolated, inspected, and either preventively or reactively treated in the case of positive identification. Russet mites are not the only pests such a system prevents, and since their life cycle is fast, it is most optimal to quarantine for longer life cycle pests in any event as a standard operating procedure. Genetic plant resistance, when consistently robust, is one of the most efficient preventative strategies because it is passive and relies on the plant's own capabilities to largely outgrow and or stymie pest damage. However, strong resistance like this is not the reality for many species or at least certain desirable cultivars, since selecting such traits is a tumultuous balancing act between varied, even diametrically opposed defensive reactions to environmental and biological threats, while still keeping the same or better quality and yield. There has been some success in tomatoes, garlic, and a few other plants. With their overwhelming array of toxins that exploit a plant's signaling system to dramatic effect, it may be necessary to overwhelm their own narrowly specialized toxin tolerance. Aside from defensive chemistry, other physical attributes like glandular and non-glandular trichomes, which commonly serve a disruptive role by preventing easy contact with the surface for pests, can also interfere with certain predators in certain contexts, while russet mites are able to weave through them, resulting in less effective predation. This isn't necessarily true for all plants or the only variable, as there is a great variety of trichomes and arrangements, even between crop cultivars, as well as certain trichomes providing what's called tuft domatia, which are refuge for predatory mite eggs found in peppers, for example. Russet mites do not tend to be reported developing resistances to toxic systemic compounds or even safe non-harsh chemical agents, which corroborates with their smaller genetic arsenal. Many products are compatible with foliage and hardy plant structures like horticultural oils, which can suffocate or overwhelm a wide range of insects and mites. Some products are composed of compounds derived from plants, fungi, bacteria, or other natural sources that are toxic to the pest but not to people. Basic sulfur in the form of wettable or micronized sulfur is an accessible and easy to implement broad spectrum agent with fungicidal, insecticidal, and miticidal effects and can be used at concentrations that do not significantly affect net composition of the nearby environment or substrate microbiome. Burning sulfur is not recommended as it produces the noxious air pollutant sulfur dioxide which is highly damaging to lung and mucous membrane tissues, and it should also be said that wettable sulfur is not recommended if dank, sticky trichomes such as herbal or medicinal plants are the harvested target as sulfur particles may become entrapped and have a fouling effect on the final product. One exception to this lack of resistance is the citrus rust mite, 
as populations across Earth have developed resistance to the DDT-adjacent dicofol, chlorobenzylate, and Zynep. Other recent mites that have been shown to develop resistances include the peach silver mite, Aculus cornutus, pear recet mite, Epitrimerus pyri, and apple recet mite, Aculus schlechtendali. Another example is the tomato recet mite, which only after three seasonal applications of the noxious compound methamidophos in 1985 Egypt, resistance was detected. Considering all these factors, a generic IPM strategy for recet mites might include a preventative component, either a spray application like wettable sulfur at regular intervals or a biological control like the most appropriate predatory mites for a crop. These are probably not going to be compatible measures, but some crops may have sufficient shelter and resources to keep the predators fighting fit for more mild solutions. Sprays have the potential to be wasteful to some degree unless applied immediately before or after detection, while a passive living system can be more efficient to some degree since they only need to be applied a few times, but come with the extra need for sustainment by food and water. There may be other options for preventative biocontrols like fungi, such as Bouveri bassiana, Menarhesium anisopliae, or Isaria fumosauracea, as has been trialed in spray solutions on citrus rust mite to severe effect, or some of the other natural species if they become available as commercial products in the future. For this reason, it is important to keep up to date on advances in agricultural solutions against recet mites. Although not always relevant or viable, check to see if resistant cultivars are available. Recognize though, that genetic pest resistance is specific, fickle, and complex, particularly against recet mites, with some mite subpopulations doing better in some locations over others and the need for controlled testing to validate to what degree and under which circumstances russet mice are best resisted by these cultivars. Resistance breeding often takes several years, possibly up to a decade, before a provably resistant cultivar can be confirmed. Cruelly, the trait conferring resistance may not pass to progeny easily or be susceptible to pest adaptation. If the breeding source cannot answer questions about how the trait was confirmed or what the effect actually is or provide data from such trials, the attribute can't be accounted for. Quarantine of incoming plants and culling of potential hosts like individual plants that might escape cultivation nearby are usually worth the effort and logistical complexity, at least in sheltered settings like controlled environments and greenhouses. Considering the cost of pest spread to quality and yield or cosmetic appeal, as well as even one reactive measure in product and labor, such a system will pay for itself after only a single capture. Unlike other pests that may fly like insects and enter a cultivation space through a structural opening, recet mites are most commonly facilitated by human traffic on clothing and in cuttings or whole new plants. Learning to recognize the signs of damage may also allow growers to recognize the unsuitability of the plant before handling it, which can allow actions to be taken before moving it. Regardless of preventative technique, crops must be evaluated at regular intervals to assess these preventative measures are functioning by looking for signs of biocontrols or application schedule. Weekly intervals are common, but depending on the context, it may be possible to sample most or all plants multiple times per week. Scouting also ensures the early and rapid detection of pests, in this case, recet mites, and observing the relevant predators at close proximity in the same sample is often a sign that the biocontrols are actively degrading the colony. At the point of detection, integrated pest management strategy shifts to reactive techniques, where efficacy is measured by the speed of treatment and resolution of the pest presence. Ideally, most or all locations 
where the resumite has colonized will be confirmed by direct observation and marked in some way for later targeting. Scouts or other personnel that were active in these areas should reduce contact with other plants until they have removed any potential items like clothing that could carry the mites and perhaps change into new clothing. Proper hygiene should be enforced to reduce cross-contamination wherever practicable. Infested material like branches or whole plants may be removed and sealed carefully to reduce movement to other plants during the culling process. For cheaper annual plants, it can often be less expensive to cull a complete plant than attempt to treat it or the effects of contamination. But crop value, IPM resources, and loss budgeting will dictate if pertinent. 